Welcome back everybody to your daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire and we're back um, with the f hopefully final ram rambling on uh, book one, The Spark and the Ashes of, Memory of Memories of Ice. And yes, we have started a new knitting project. I started today. It's not exactly a lot right now, as you can see. It's well, technically it's a lot already because this is super long. This will be like, well, the idea is to make a cape. We'll see how that actually works out. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I mean, I just started with this and we'll see how that goes. And the big challenge there is that I'll figure out how to actually do a cape while I'm doing it. And, and this is the other part is, um, this is like far longer rows than like on the scarf. So progress will be much slower to actually witness and uh, I'm a terribly impatient person and um, so it will be interesting and quite the challenge to see if I like how I can actually do this and how I will feel about it in I don't know a couple of hours or a couple of days and if I'll you know if I actually bring the patience and stamina to actually keep this uh, thing going we will see um but yeah let's go into um memories of ice again cheers <sighs> all right so um what are the really important bits to talk about today? Um, we're nearing the end. Like, I mean, the last chapters in that first book, um, a lot of stuff happens. Once again, a lot of, um, how to say, a lot of world building and information stuff happens there. Um, a few odd things happen where I found some inconsistency and then we have some serious stuff. But let's start with the inconsistency. So at some point, um, Ganoas Paran is drawn into the Azath house, the finest house in Georgistan. And he meets everyone's favorite Jagha tyrant, Raced. And holy shit, I love his humor. Um, well, I, I knew that before, but he's, he's, he's a really cool dude. Um, I mean, yeah, we wanted to enslave an entire continent. Well, apart from that, he seems to be rather a funny guy. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. At the beginning, when he enters, like when his spirit is like dragged into the um, the Azath house, he finds Relic, Nom, and Vulcan lying there. You remember at the end of Gardens of the Moon, those uh, like Relic carries Vulcan into that house for whatever reason. And they're lying there and they're sleeping there, apparently. And it is mentioned that uh, Relic has his oiled braid and that should not be there because we remember when he fights a uh, clan, uh, clan leader Ocelot, 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 however you want to pronounce him. Um, <laughs> the guy who's named after the cat, basically. Um, we find him. Uh, when they fight up on uh, the, the Belfry Tower of uh, Kroll's Temple in... Darugistan, um, Ocelot grabs Relic by the by that that braid and then um, to drag his head back, and then Relic in that fight cuts off his own braid. So how the fuck does he have his braid now? Is there something magical happening in the House of the Azath, or is it just something that <laughs> Stephen Erickson uh, kind of overlooked um, uh, while writing the book? I dare not to speculate on that um just yeah just wanted to mention that when i read it this time i was like wait a second this is weird all right now with just like you know the first like small bit then uh, something else that i found interesting we have a confrontation shortly before the whole thing with the master of the deck stuff happens which obviously we will have to talk about a bit more. But before that, we have that, that confrontation between Kalor and um, Anamanda Rake and Caldan Brood about Silver Fox. And um, what is what I found 
personally interesting is the appearance of Whiskey Jack when he shows up on his horse. And Erickson mentions that he holds it in a perfect square stance. And this is interesting to me. I don't know how many of you um, have experience with horse riding and uh, especially like the dressage uh, riding of horses and stuff like that. But to actually, when halting your horse, um, that perfect square stance is basically what you try to do, uh, what is the, the way you have to, you have to actually halt your horse when you're riding a horse in that, those kind of circles. Obviously, if you're riding somewhere in the open, you don't really need to think about that. But the point is that to be able to do that and to do that is about control. It's about self-control and it's about control of the horse because obviously if you don't have self-control you won't be able to control your horse that you're riding. So um, to show that Whiskey Jack when he comes into that like circle and stops his horse he stops it that way. I can, that shows in that small detail um, the amount of self-control Whiskey Jack has over himself and because of that self-control that he has, uh, that he has the control he has over himself, he has also that control in a way um, over um, his soldiers. And we found out we found that out before, right? But it's kind of shown there because you don't stop your horse by just brute force. It's it's about training and discipline and a connection to your to the animal you're riding in that situation. So we learn in that small scene, we basically learn or get shown that the control that Whiskey Jack has over the bridge burners can be like seen in a similar way as this like mix of self-discipline, discipline and trust between um, the soldiers and their commander or, or not officially commander, but you know what I mean. And yeah, I know this is super unimportant <laughs> for the grand scheme of things. I just uh, felt, I don't know, when I read it today, I, it just reminded me of that. And I was like, oh, that's actually done, deftly done, sir, is what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I just felt that this was an interesting look at these small scenes to see how um, Ericsson manages to put a lot of meaning into... Um, like very small scenes and like show a lot of like greater details and pack a lot of information in a rather like on surface level, rather meaningless small detail where it's like, oh yeah, right. Okay, apparently he's able to stop his horse in a perfect square stance. Anyway, um, that's um, enough for me talking about horse riding, which probably some of you know way more about than I do. <laughs> Although to be fair, I actually do know a little about it. And, okay, so that's the next small bit that I just felt like um, putting out there. All right, what else should we talk about? <laughs> now we see that um, Ganoas Paran, Captain Paran, has become a um, the master of the deck. We can learn a couple of things here that I found I find interesting. One is um, he got he was chosen for this. How exactly him he was chosen for this is kind of a I don't know exactly how. Apparently, there's a connection between him walking or entering um, um, uh, Dragnipur and getting out of it again. But I'm not quite sure right now how that works. But I said before, I'm not the master. I'm not a lore master here. I'm just like someone who um, reads and thinks. And um, okay, but um, apart from that, the interesting thing that we learn here is, and that's when Race said like, that he was chosen for this role because this role, the master of the deck, was needed. So apparently, up to the point that we have right now, which is. We don't exactly know what happens. I mean, I yes, I don't want to spoiler it because I'm not quite sure how easy it is to pick on these things up. Now I'm rereading it, so I'm like, yeah, of course it was. It, it's basically clear what will happen there. <laughs> what with um, the crippled god paying that art, well, not paying, but um, 
pressuring this artist um, in an earlier chapter to make um, obviously cards that are very similar to the deck of dragons and um, now the deck of dragons needing someone who is a master of the deck we learn that apparently it's possible to create new cards and enter new cards i mean we we knew that before because it was mentioned that at some point high house shadow and um appeared in the deck of dragons and i'm still not quite sure how that works but apparently suddenly people who have the talent to work with that uh, deck of dragons kind of feel the need to have that card as well and paint that card into their thing they're making. Uh, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that apparently adding new cards is possible and something that is happening right now requires the the deck of dragons to have a master. And we once again learn that the deck of dragons is somehow connected with the Azath. Um, I'm not going to go into what the Azath are or is or whatever, if there's one or two. The thing that I wanted to focus on is that the Azath uses things or people in this case. It's not like it chose Paran for whatever reason. And he has no say in the matter. He just gets like um, press ganged basically <laughs> into being, um, into being uh, the master of the deck, whether he wants that or not. And um, now we've learned from uh, earlier um, uh, encounters with um, uh, Ganoa's Paran that he's not exactly the kind of person who, <laughs> how can I say that, um, who enjoys being used or being forced into a role. That's not, you know, his like strong suit. He's rather the other way around. He just like really doesn't want to do that. So it'll be interesting to see how he uh, copes with the fact that he got chosen by something that seems to be way above, uh, like in in magnitudes above, um, in, above um, Opon, for example, when it comes to levels of power or even the organization of the universe so he he got away with not actually working for opon but does can he get away with um not doing what the azath requires him to do that's that's going to be an interesting thing for the for the upcoming chapters um but yeah i wanted to look into this idea uh, like let not look into but focus on this idea of the um of sometimes the universe um, putting demands on humans or on people in general that um, cannot be denied, whether you want to or not. It's just like there's no there's no choice whatsoever in there, and that's brutal. And that's that's like a very brutal thing, and it kind of shows that um, that edge of uh, free will or choice or what what have you or agency in a way. Um, it still remains to be seen why there is um, why there is need for a master of the deck. We'll figure that one out later on. But yeah, so that bit was a very interesting like to see how ruthless in a way those forces the Azath just like use a human, whether they um, want that or not. There's like no regard for if that would damage Paran or whatever. This is just like a tool is needed. You use the next best thing thing you get, and then you'll just do that, basically. Now, um, that was just like a th small random thought on that whole um, him being used by the Azath. All right, what else? He enters the Hold of the Beast, which seems to be the place where the Talan Imas spirit world used to be when they still had one. And this is this is an interesting thing there, right? You know, he when Paran realized that they have outlived their gods, have lived out, outlived their spirits and everything, they have just basically now their own new warren that's the Warren of Dust. And since we know the Talan I must have entered that the ritual of Talan 
um, voluntarily, at least most of them did, I suspect. Um, it's kind of interesting to compare that, you know, to that whole Nietzsche, God is dead, we killed him kind of kind of situations. Like they voluntarily <laughs> abandoned their entire spirit world, and uh, this is something that is very like that's very very powerful. There, the, the idea of a people deciding to abandon their past, their spirit world, something that is basically, that's vital to their, like, um, identity in a way, to their um, well-being, obviously, as well, their, to their souls, in a way. <clears throat> and abandon all of that for whatever they found in the Ritual of Talon, which is just that one goal, that is to kill, um, and kill, and kill, and kill. Um, Jackhard. And so... Um, and Peran realizes how terrible, what a terrible loss that must have been for the Talani mass, and uh, he feels sorrow and compassion for the Talani mass there. So this is an interesting look at the Talani mass in general. Right, um, that was that bit about the Talani mass. All right, there was another thing. Um, yeah, right, the big thing we need to talk about, I suspect, and I'm completely not suited to do that, unfortunately, like not qualified, I, I should say, is actually the whole situation with the Maibi. Um, and at the, uh, at the end of chapter five, that is, um, when she confronts, like, Realizes what like not realize yeah kind of realizes or debates with herself her situation that she has ha like has had all choice taken away from her by her daughter something I've spoke about before and then she decides that she wants to uh, kill herself and uh, Corlat says that she cannot allow that and we come to like a very very interesting debate on the whole idea of suicide and whether. An individual has the right to do that or not, and uh, whether outside forces have the right to intervene there. Um, now, obviously, in this case, there is... Well, not only... Like, what I'm trying to say here is that with the setup that we have with um, Fire Silver Fox, Silver Fox drawing life force directly from the Maibi, these connections that you have in real life between, like, in relationships between people, what I said yesterday, they are made more explicit by actually being a magical link in a way. They are made more visible or tangible, I, sus I suppose is the right word here. And um, that that's kind of the, the that, that kind of makes that debate more i don't want to say more poignant but it makes it kind of interesting because we have that like two different aspects there we have the one aspect there of like the idea of um suicide is like the only actual choice the the maybe feels she still has the only agency still has she still has everything else has been so she thinks taken away from her by her daughter silver fox and then even that choice and agency is denied her. Now, um, it's kind of interesting to see that it is Corlat at this point. It is Andy to, uh, who steps up and says that she believes and has faith in the strength of the Maibi. Um, that rings really inter That's really interesting com when you compare it to Counselor of Moonspawn's brand new video on uh, the depiction of depression within the Tist Andy and her assessment of that. Because Cora at this point is already acting very much against the general um, Tist Andy traits that have been described by Anamanda Rake before and so forth. And we know that because. Even even the Maybe says, like, don't mock me when you claim to have faith, you're on his Andy. So that's interesting. It obviously seems to hurt Corlat, so that when when the Maybe says that. So apparently Corlat has found has faith 
and has found faith. And the question is, is she just very special? Is she very, is she just a different, like, differs, ma does she actually just differ from her kin, from the other Tist Andy? Or is this a, reawake, a reawakening of these emotions? Has she, whatever reason, found whatever reason to actually get away from that numbness that um, is so um, typical of the Tist Andy, this, this remoteness, this numbness to all kinds of emotions and so forth. Um, and that is something that we might explore in future chapters. I just found it interesting that Corlett is here already acting in a quite different way. And that is something that I found uh, <clears throat> interesting. Another thing that is very powerful here is when um, I think it's Crone talking. Yes, yeah, when when the Crone when Crone the, the Raven talks to the to the Maybe about Silver Fox and says that in the end Silver Fox has more of the Maybe her mother her like physical mother than from those three souls that are <clears throat> entwined in the soul that is Silver Fox. Three, four, whatever. And that is something that I found very interesting, especially when you compare it to some of the things Steven Erickson has said in other situations recently <clears throat> about his belief, not, yeah, not his belief, but <clears throat> about how family <clears throat> and nearness and connection to um, to family are very, very important for a, a child's um, uh, development. And that shows up in the, the relationship between Maybe and uh, Silver Fox in several places where I said like that children need the nearness of, need human contact and need the contact of their family, their actual family in a way, or people that take the role of their parents or whatever. Um, for both spiritual and physical growth. And once again, this is made very, very, um, like, overtly, shown overtly by those magical links between Silver Fox and the Maybe, but it's also discussed in other situations there. So that's something I found uh, a very, very powerful scene. And, yeah, this, I said it before, the discussion of, um, like, the entire part of the Maybe is extremely powerful, but it's very, very difficult, emotionally taxing to read. Uh, especially, like, not especially, but in any case, it's very, like, taxing for me to read in any case. So that's what I was trying to say. Um, all right. Um, what else did I miss? Yeah, good good question. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of like plot stuff happening near the end of book one with, you know, Gruntle and the caravan guards encountering um, the Kachain Jamal for the first time. And yeah, under dinosaurs with swords. Holy shit, that's pretty cool. Um, I just don't like... There's, there's obviously also stuff going on there. I just don't feel that it it just didn't touch me on that emotional or like make me think deep thoughts kind of level that other parts of the book make. It's just like very well written um, action scenes and stuff like that. We see more of um, our good friends, um, uh, Corbel Brooch and uh, Beaujolaine. Um, we, um, what kind of evil badasses they are. That's really cool. Um, we have. Well, the discussion of how to deal with um, propaganda is probably something that should also be put a, like that. I found interesting when they are in Salto when they are in Saltoan, um, and Karuli talks to um, to the thieves and bandits there uh, about the Panyans, um missionaries and priests and how to deal with them and that violence that violence is not a good way to um, counter um, conspiracy or um, preaching or, yeah, the missionary work. Because that's 
Yeah, I already said. <laughs> I already said conspiracy. That's what I w where I wanted to go. It's the uh, the point is that if um, you have people spreading lies, misinformation, whatever that misinformation may be, the problem with the way how conspiracies are structured, and conspiracy th thinking is structured, means that if whoever is um, perceived as the authority, and conspiracies are obviously always. Um, arrayed against the authority, the perceived authority. Um, um, the point is that if those perceived authorities then crack down on the purveyors of a conspiracy, a belief, or what have you, yeah, this will create martyrs. This makes it very, very diff difficult there. And Karuli's idea is you have to sway the minds so the people themselves has to have to cast out are the ones who need to do the casting out or killing or whatever of those priests but it has to be them who do that and you have to do it by words and that's that's obviously like i mean that's that's easier said than done it's probably relatively easily done in the case of the rather simple um messages the priests of the panion seer bring but it's still the only way you can do that up to a point there and um i just found that very interesting especially when you look at um current political situations all over the planet i'm not singling anything out i'm just saying the idea of how to deal with um weird beliefs or conspiracy theories is something that is relevant today is what i'm trying to say here all right, I guess that's it for today, and I think also for book one of Memories of Ice. And I'll see you tomorrow with more knitting and uh, maybe first things about book two of Memories of Ice. We will see. Until then, cheers. <laughs>